We're going to talk about something today. The best is yet to come. How many of you believe the best is yet to come? Can you say amen? Amen. He's not finished with us yet. Amen. The best is yet to come. Now, 2022, and we know obviously the COVID situation, we've come through that. And there were certain things we're going good in this. Where's this thing going, so to speak? And yet we know our God is on the move. And we know that our God is obviously doing things in our lives and in this church that obviously that would just amaze us as he would open up the full revelation of that. We would be aghast at like, Lord, I didn't realize you were doing that. I didn't realize the future that you had for me. I thought everything was bleak. <laughs> and you see the, the obviously the negativity today in every aspect of our culture today. But that's not who we are. Jesus said, come out and be separate. We're consecrated. We're set apart for Jesus Christ. We, we, we obviously march to the beat of a different drummer. His name is Jesus. Okay. So we're going to look at the book of Haggai. Everybody know Mr. Haggai? <laughs> He's Old Testament prophet. Okay. And we're going to read in verses 1 through 12. If you'd like to stand while we read that, certainly you're welcome to do that and speak with me. Haggai, chapter 1, and we'll start at verse 1. Everybody ready? In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shetiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. And this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. And then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. It is time for the, yourselves to be living in your. It is a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin. And now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. And this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. <clears throat> Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build a house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. And you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, is because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. And therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. And I call for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle and on the labor of your hands. And then Zerubbabel, son of Shetiel, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the message of the prophet Haggai. Because why? The Lord, their God, had sent them and the people feared the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Haggai is giving a word from the Lord, and I believe it's a word for us today. It's a, it's a word I believe we need to pay close attention to. Because God's saying that we've been busy. We're doing a lot of stuff. But I want you to reassess your life. In the last couple of weeks, I've been talking about it in my life. I take a look at my life and I look and reassess. I come back. If there are things God shows me, I confess it to him, repent of them. If there are things that God is saying, I need to fine tune and, and tweak here in the direction that you're going. I begin to, to just allow the Lord to do that because, you know, the busyness and all the things of the world, the cares of, the li of life and all those things pull us away from why we're here today. And this is what was happening at that particular time. They weren't building the house of the Lord, but they had built their houses and they were some nice houses. They're paneled, they were great and so forth. But they had forgotten about the Lord. And so what Haggai is saying here is to take careful thought about these things. In other words, be careful, remain steadfast, Take a look at where you're going and allow the Spirit of God to examine your heart 
and, and allow him to make correction as he deems necessary. We look at this today, and why are we here? Well, in Acts chapter 1, the Bible says that you'll receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in all the world, Samaria, Jerusalem, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. He said you'll receive power. You're Christian here, and you have the Holy Spirit of God residing within you. You've got power. You can ask the Lord to baptize you and fill you until you're overflowing with power. We need power to live the Christian life. We need power to love as Jesus loves. We need power to resist sin. We need power to flee from temptation. And God is saying the power is there and it's available. But many times God waits till we ask. Okay. But that's why we're here. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Go into all the world. Make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I've taught you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. He said, this is the great commission. And that's our commission here today. And so as we begin this new year, let's take and reassess where we are in these particular priorities. Because how is the work of the church slowed down? It's slowed down by getting Satan distracting you and me from the priorities, you see. He can't destroy the church because Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But he can slow it down. He can get us off track from what God has of us today. So he does that. And so if we're going to rediscover God's priority for our lives, then we've got to get out of our comfort zone. We got to get out of our comfort zone. We're comfortable. We become complacent. We become status quo. God is saying for anything to happen, we've got to risk. And faith is spelled R-I-S-K. You risk. And because without faith, it's impossible to please God. We know how important it is to walk by faith and not by sight. And we know how important it is to get out of the boat. Peter got out of the boat. Now he sank. Jesus went over and picked him up. Yes, he did, and we know that. But Peter was just brash enough to be able to get up out of the boat. All the other disciples were probably pushing on him, saying, Peter, you go ahead, and we'll wait back here for you. But he's telling us that we've got to get out of our comfort zones. We're going to do some new things, I believe, in 2023 that we didn't do in 2022, okay? They may be different. They'll be godly, and they'll be led by the Spirit of the Lord. But it may not be the same as we've always done it. You see, I've talked about the fact that how uh, God has done different things in this church in the sense of how you perceive church to be and so forth. Uh, it's not. We've had a, a group of awesome people that have come into our presence through Save Savage that we had the wonderful privilege of being a part of and having ministry reciprocal back and forth between the two and beginning to build the church. You say, I never thought that anything of that. Did y'all? I never, I never thought, what in the world? Going into a bar and sharing the gospel? I mean, come on. This is not traditionally the, the church and the way the mission looked at. I want to tell you, let's just get honest. It's not. But it's God. And see, if we want God, we're going to have to do some things that we didn't think that obviously we would ever do. But you see, tradition will obviously keep us in that place of complacency. Tradition is we haven't ever done it that way before. The seven last words of the church. We've never done it that way before, Jim. Never done it. Well, we may do some things in this new year that we have not done before, but it will be God. And the reason why is we talk about the church and being a family and being community, and I've talked about it over the years, is because we all need to learn to hear the voice of God. We all need to hear God speaking. And so we're all marching along as the army of God in unison together, not separated. But I want to tell you today, there's a powerhouse in this church, not us. It's the spirit of God. And when we get a, get a, and get in on what God's doing, there will be nothing that can stop us from what God wants to do. Now, this is hope and encouragement for 2023. The reason why I'm saying this, because I pray that God's spirit would stir your hearts to look at life and to be able to say, okay, what is going on and where am I at? 
Am I really seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness? Because the Bible says when you do that, all other things will be added unto you. And we need to be God-governed and not self-governed. But see, the issue is so often is we're self-governed. Self is really strong. Never gets any better. Again, before we go home to be with the Lord in the presence of eternity with Jesus, it will no longer be any, make any difference. But while we're here, there's a battle going on. The battle's going on between the flesh and the spirit. And many times we'll yield to the, the flesh because it's easy. It's status quo. It's comfortable. <laughs> and the flesh will tell you, you don't need to do that. You think this, I mean, this wild bunch over here at Lighthouse Fellowship, they have lost their minds, right? <laughs> right? They renewed our minds, as Don said. But that's what happens, see? Because, you know, we do start doing some things and you think, man, this pastor, Jim, he's gone off the rails. I thought I knew him. He's, he's, a, he's a wacko. I'm not sure about him at this point in my life as a pastor. And I'm not saying to do things ridiculous and so forth. I'm not. But the Spirit of God doesn't always do the things like what we think he wants to do, okay? I think we've learned that in our life, right? So there are three things that Haggai is saying here that we need to do also individually and as a, as a church. First of all, we need to ass assessment of what's happening. We need to take and look, be careful, a careful examination of what we've done and also asking the Lord to give us a vision for this new year and where we're going as a church and individuals also. And so an assessment is to appraise or evaluate. And Haggai is saying here, give careful thought to your ways. In other words, don't just flippantly go through life haphazardly. Listen to what the Spirit is saying. The Bible says if, to walk in the Spirit and you'll not gratify the lust of the flesh. We got to learn how to walk in the Spirit. We got to learn to listen to Him. See, He will guide us if we'll learn to listen. But what happened to these people? They were too busy. What happens in our life? We get too busy. I got to get this done. If it doesn't get done, if I don't get it done. And before long, God is not even in the, any type of the picture of what you feel like, obviously, is priority of your life. He's already taken a back seat into what's happening. Isn't that true? We're busy. Man, we're busy. And here in America, we've got so much stuff that materialism comes in and obviously takes the place of everything. Because it's about getting and getting and so forth instead of giving. Instead of obviously surrender our lives to the Lord. But he said assessment is what he's telling the people to do here. But assessment, when God speaks to us, we may have good intentions. But if we don't put it into action, then obviously, then we've not moved at all. God is, yeah, I got good intentions here. I know spiritual stuff. I mean, hey, come on. But if we don't take and listen to God, you see, here it is. You think, well, I, I'm kind of a rival. I've learned it all. Let me tell you, I haven't. And God is always doing. And in the book and scripture in Isaiah, he says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. See, it's popping up in front of you. And that is out, the outpouring of God's spirit. God doing those things in our life, doing it in our church. In this church, we can have renewal if we desire it, if we hunger for it and thirst for it. We obviously, uh, I'm just going to read something because Nancy was playing a uh, video here uh, earlier about the birth of Jesus. And Mary was uh, quoting under her breath uh, a psalm here. And, you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, they were headed into Bethlehem and uh, they were not in a obviously a real good environment like what we have right but she said this and i'll read it to you psalm 63 oh god you are my god earnestly i seek you my soul thirsts for you my body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water i've seen you in your sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory and because your love is better than life my lips will glorify you. I'm seeking you in a dry and weary land. My lips will praise you. I'm hungry for you. We don't want any more of God. Then God just waits till we do get hungry. 
Because you see, he's the only one who can satisfy. And sometimes people, I believe, are starving spiritually. They're famished because they're, they're obviously not feeding that part of him, of us, that is most important, and that's our spiritual life. And so we've got to change. Can not remain the same. God is doing a new thing, but it's got to be intentional. It doesn't happen automatically. Second thing is, is agreement. And agreement is to be in harmonious unity, to be in one accord or fully compatible here. He says, give careful thoughts to your ways here. Why is that? It's because obviously only an accurate assessment brings agreement. And busyness, I believe, is our greatest enemy again. An accurate assessment brings agreement, agreement with God and agreement with one another. When we're on the same page here in this place and we're listening to the Spirit of God direct our paths and we obviously are saying, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to say. go. I'll say whatever you tell me to say. God has complete freedom in our lives and nothing is impossible for us. God working through us. Nothing at all. But see what happens, we've got to be in agreement with God. It's His plan. It's not our plan. We sometimes think it's about us. It's not about us. It's not about our problems. Oh, he loves us and he, he delivers and he frees us and so forth. Sometimes he leaves us in those problems for a reason because he's making us more like Jesus. But it's about him. But we got to agree with him. Said, Lord, we've examined our lives. And we believe there's some things you want to, that we need for you to do in our lives that we haven't seen happen. We want you to do it now, Lord. So that agreement has to take place here. That agreement with one another. Amos chapter 3 says, Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? We've got to get on the same page as far as the direction for Lighthouse Fellowship. You've got to get on the same page in your life individually and as a family to be in agreement, to be able to walk in the power that God has available for us. Because if we're in conflict... If we're in all of this squabbling and so forth, and that happens a lot. You see families today, and there's squabbling going on and all this type of stuff. And, and it just feels like they continue to go down the same path, and it's the path that goes downward. It never gets any better. Because they continue to travel the same way they always have traveled, and they're not willing to change course. But you see, when you assess, have God's Spirit to assess you, and then you agree with God. God's saying, I'm going to do something here. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool, you see. Because Satan wants us to be comfortable in our sin. And we think, yeah, but I'm not in any really bad immorality. I mean, some really blatant stuff out there or, or some of these other things. But there are things in our lives that God is saying, I'm not finished with you yet. And he's saying today that he wants us to become more like Jesus. He wants us those things. But see, Satan says, come on. Ah, they really don't make any difference. Are you kidding me? Jim's getting a little bit particular and peculiar about this and that and so forth. Is this biblical and so forth? Yes, it is. Because he wants to set us free totally. Jesus said, I came to set the captive free. But you see, Satan makes us comfortable. God's saying, come let us reason together. Let's talk about it. Bring it out in the open and let's talk about it. So you remember our number one priority in his kingdom and his righteousness. That's number one. We think we're number one. We got it backwards. His kingdom and his righteousness is number one. And we get out of whack when that takes place. So where are we going as a church today? What is God's direction for us to walk together in agreement? An African proverb says this, the man who tries to walk two roads will split his pants. <laughs> Likewise, we could say the church that walks two roads is a church split. Okay. And we may not just formally split, and I'm not saying that. But if your heart is not in agreement, if you're not really ready to really get on board and say, this is where we're going, Jim, and I want to be a part of it, you see, then somehow it doesn't work like God would have it to work. So what's our priority? Number one is loving God. Loving God. The first commandment, Mark chapter 12, says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbors yourself. 
you know. And I've always said, been real, real honest with you and so forth. God is teaching me to love people because some people I just don't like, right? So God's not finished with me. That's proof, right? You know, I can come to church and I've got my, my starch shirt on and so forth, my pants and my shoes and all this stuff. Everything looks good and so forth. But when you get down, God, look at my heart. He look at your heart too. You're loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Are you loving your neighbors yourself? Are you having really like a real problem with that neighbor? Are you having a real problem with the fact that, Lord, you know, you're calling me to give up something that I feel like I really want to clutch to, something that is not really, not bad necessarily, but it's not your best. See, God wants us to have his best. And when we can't hold on to those things, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Are you in the world? Are you of the world? See, sometimes, again, we look like the world more than the world looks like the world, okay? And we're to come out and be separate. And we're to come out, we're different. Again, we're going upstream like those salmon. We're doing things differently. But it's going to take you and me out of our comfort zone. The church has to do that. It's a time, I believe, 2023 is going to be an explosive year. But we need to obviously realize that. You believe it is the thing. Loving God. And then also loving people, building community, loving people, okay? When new people come in here, are we going up introducing ourselves to them? We're saying, hey, my name is such and such. We want to welcome you here, you know? See, I, I, I know that obviously I lo I'm very much um, a creature of habit. And I like, I sit up front. Well, that's... Kind of my labeled as my my seat. And I love to just be there. I'm comfortable. But are you thinking about getting out of your seat, loving people, loving those around us and so forth? Are you engaged when you come? Are you feeling like, man, I'm just going through the motions and I feel like, hey, let's hurry up and get out of here so we can go up here, maybe to Luby's like the Methodist Church does or something, you know, or whoever else, right? <laughs> Man, I'm getting some <clears throat> clearing of their throats and all this other stuff going on when I'm saying these things, okay? I'm not sure what that means, but anyway, here it is, right? Loving God and loving people. Evangelism. Evangelism, and it happens outside these four walls. One-on-one, -on -one, many times, like I was talking about yesterday. It doesn't have to be Christians. You can talk to people. If God points somebody out to you, do it. He'll give you a word of knowledge many times. And that word of knowledge is something he speaks in your heart real quick. It's there. And you step out and you begin to share about that. I've shared about that before. And it takes you getting out of your comfort zone. But let me tell you, I don't know of a time where people have said, Jim, Jim I don't want to hear this stuff, okay? In most cases, they've said, I needed to hear that. But we ignore that. Why? It's because we're busy. We hit H-E-B, a Kroger, and we've got our grocery list and blah, blah. We're going through and we're not paying attention. And there are people all over the place. And man, this world is all around us and we're not evangelizing. We think, well, we get to church, we'll evangelize. Yeah, that's great. But most happens just a, we're here an hour and a half. Remember, this new year is going to present some opportunities if you're willing to step out in faith. The other is discipleship. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Believers, yes. But move them from believers to disciples. Disciples are followers of Jesus. Okay? Not just somebody that has checked off saying, yes, I believe in Jesus. I've accepted Jesus. Yes, thank God for that. But disciples not staying there is growing in your relationship with Jesus. And that means we're going to have to do something. We're going to have to do something maybe we haven't done before. Generosity. The tithe is certainly bringing the tithe into sore house. Definitely the tithe, 10% there and so forth. If you do that, watch God bless you. I'm not legalistic, but I know Malachi and I know the word of God is true. And uh, we've seen it before. And so if you tithe your 10 percent off of obviously the, your gross what you get tithe and watch what god does with it in fact god says go beyond the tithe 
In fact, we go to a point of sacrificial giving beyond that, and that's when God really blesses. Let me tell you, God is going to pour His Spirit out when we're generous with our time, our, our monies, our talents, and so forth, our gifts. Be family friend, friendly. Let me ask you a question. You think this church is family friendly? You think this church is fam family friendly? Friendly, okay? Just a question. Don't start clearing your throat. <laughs> And then also a commitment to excellence. A commitment to excellence. Are we committing to excellence here? I mean, is this important? Is your relationship with Jesus important? Is your relationship with the church important? Or it's just like, well, this is where you've been. I appreciate that. Don't, I'm not putting it down at all or anybody, okay? I'm making saying we're doing an assessment and we want to agree with God, right? We've got to move on from agreement, and we've got to move on to action. The last thing is we've got, to, we've got to move out because our values are shown by our own behavior, and people watch us when you don't even realize they're watching you. They watch you certainly in a church, but when you leave this place, see, I can again spiff you up real spiffy, and everything's good, hey, and be real nice. Hey, how you doing? Great. See, everything is good. When the rubber hits the road, it's outside these four walls. When somebody cuts me off in traffic. When somebody doesn't speak kindly to me when I'm in line. Or maybe the line is too long. Whatever it may be, God is looking and God is with us. And God is saying our values, obviously, are shown by our, our behavior. Need to reach out. Take particular. It's going to take us out of our comfort zone. Because we've got to act on it. Because I want to tell you today, when we obviously assess what's going on and we agree with God and agree together, there's nothing impossible that we can do. Listen to Matthew 18. This is what I'm saying. Jesus said, if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. New agreement? Man, I want to get in on it. Agreement. If you have any questions about that, you can come to me or any of the leadership team and let us talk about it. Come, let us reason together. And come, let us talk about it. Let us pray about it. And let us all get on the same page that God can use us individually, family-wise, but also as a church today. Let your light so shine before all men that they may see your good works, that they may glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen. We want our light not to be put under a bushel. We need our light shining into the darkness because I'm going to tell you today that we're living in a dark world and there's a battle going on for people's souls all around us today. And sometimes it looks like Satan, you're winning this battle. I know who wins. Jesus wins. But you and I have got to get in the battle. We've got to get in the fray. And it takes us getting uncomfortable to do what God's called us to do. He's calling us to do that. Take that assessment, agree, and then we take action and move out. Look at what he says. Haggai said, well, when that happened, the people obeyed the voice of the Lord. Okay? God's called us to assess our priorities, and then he'll work through us. His power. There's no limit to his power. You'll see miracles. You'll see a demonstration of his power. Paul said, I'm coming to you. I didn't come to you with eloquent words. Or flowery speech, but what do you say? I came to you with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Don't you want to see that? We want to get into the book of Acts here shortly. And, and you want to see how the church was built and the power of the Holy Spirit doing that today. Let me tell you, he's the same Spirit, the same God. There's a song I listen to, Elevation Worship. And the title is The Same God. He's the same God that healed back then. He heals today. He's the same God that does the miracles back then that he does today. It's the same. You're the same God. And that's what we want to do. He wants to impact your life. He wants you to impact your community. He wants to impact that area you live in and your sphere of influence in such a way they'll never be the same. They obeyed, and here he goes. The second thing is, and the people fear the Lord. 
I've always said one of the things I think this country and many of us in the church have lost is the fear of God. I'm not talking about being afraid of him, although God is an awesome God. Okay, I'm talking about an awe of respect and, and, and reverence for him and honor of him. But the people said when all these things started coming into place, they then feared the Lord. The Bible talks about in the Old Testament, and I like it because I've looked at it over and over again, is that they said they learn the fear of God. It's very important that that be rediscovered in our hearts and a sense of majesty. Mary, as she was getting ready to give birth to uh, Jesus, she said, my soul is thirsty. She was quoting a Psalm of David, Psalm 63, that I just read. I'm thirsty, I'm hungry. And I'm living in a land that's so dry. She's saying, Lord, I need you to come and pour water, the water of your spirit on that dry ground of my heart. And God will do it if we'll take and pay attention. The third thing is, he says, all these things line up. He says, I am with you. I am with you. Remember, he didn't say, I'm going to explain everything to you. I'm going to get everything straight. He just said, I'll be with you. And he's with us. And he wants us to make a difference. Now, I want to share with you. And this is a word for someone here today, or you could receive it. Could be many, could be all of you here today. Is you think, as I talk about this, the best is not really going to come. That it's the same old, same old. The thing is not changed. Life hasn't turned out the way that I thought it would. There are things you start out in a blaze, and then all of a sudden, it's like in, in Isaiah, it talks about that small ring wick and that bruised reed. And God says, I'll not crush that bruised reed, and I'll not put out that small ring wick. But it hasn't turned out like what you thought here. You look at your life, and you know, much, a lot of times that's the case here. Life doesn't necessarily turn out the way that you thought it would and it might may fall really real short than what you thought or intended you see and we look around and we realize things haven't turned out the way we expected it vents have not progressed in the manner that we hope the situation we're in is not the one that we had anticipated and what would you say some people say i'm finished some people would say, I'm too far gone. Some people would say, I'm too far along, Jim. Look at my age. I'm too far gone. That's not what God says. That's the enemy telling you that. God says and tells you and me that the best is yet to come. Everything that operates in the kingdom of God operates on faith. It's why when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. But if you don't know the truth, then you'll believe what the devil tells you and say, you're finished. You've gone too far. That sin in your life or whatever it may be, and that habit or whatever is, is obviously plaguing you, you're, you're done. You're finished. And God said, no, you're not. I'm not finished with you. I'm not finished with what I want to do in your life. I'm not finished with what I want to do in your church. And I'm not finished with what I want to do in your family. But you've got to agree with God, right? Hey, God, you've got to assess it. Say, you're right. You're right. I agree, God. You see, confession, when you sin, you confess. Because what do you do? You agree with God. It's sin. He's forgiven you because of Jesus, past, present, and future. But what do you do to open that fellowship back up? You agree with God. Lord, it's sin. And I don't want it. Get rid of it. Take it out. Take that divine scalpel and cut it out. I don't want it. Some of you say, man, man, I pray that. It doesn't look like anything is happening at all. And sometimes we feel like, man, my faith is wavering. And we sometimes, we, we just won't get real and say, hey. And what happens is that we get bogged down and then we, I'm too far gone. So I might as well continue down this path because I've had it. I'm finished. <laughs> There's no more hope for me. I know I'm going to heaven. I do believe in that divine security. But I'm finished. Uh-uh. No. If that's you here today, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. You're not finished. 
You're not too far along, and you're not too far gone. That's the God that we serve. And he tells you and me that he's doing things in your lives, that he hasn't given up on us. He's not wiped his hands of us and said, man, I'm done with you. He doesn't do that. Our God is full of grace and mercy. And what does the Bible say? That his mercies are new every morning. Great is our faithfulness, O God. Hallelujah. Okay? Because we flub the dub, don't we? We flub it. And that's saying it real nice in a nice way. We do. And we know that. You say, yeah, but I'm not doing something outright. Yeah, but he says, even if you think it and you linger, it lingers there. You think about, it. say, anger towards a person, animosity towards somebody, or whatever it may be. You know God will point it out to you, but he's not finished. And let me point out a scripture that tells you and speaks to that too. It's not me just saying it and trying to give you false hope. The word of God says it in Philippians 1.6. It says, this is the confidence that we have. This is the surety that we have, that he who began a good work within you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He started it. And we can all say amen to that. Well, what he says, I'll finish it. And I'm not finished with you. So you're not too far gone and you're not too far along. Let me tell you. Remember Anna? We talked about there were two people that were waiting for the Messiah, Simeon and Anna. And Anna was waiting for redemption of Israel, right? Because redemption means, obviously, redeeming back from slaveries. We were redeemed by the Lord from the slavery of sin. The people of Israel, they were redeemed out of uh, Egypt. The same a picture of our salvation, actually, is what it is. And Anna had waited. She was, I think they were saying, maybe 80 years old or so. And she'd been in the temple courts praying. And nothing was happening. It looked like they were just sort of like, going along with this and kind of biding time. And you and I get in a position sometimes, we just feel like that we're biding time. <laughs> Man, I'm waiting for that heavenly train to get here. I've got my ticket. His name is Jesus and so forth. And God said, no, I got more for you to do. I want to do things through you and in you that you could never imagine. And Anna was waiting and waiting. And all of a sudden, man, she saw the the Messiah. Do you know God actually has a title that I believe and I've captured this is that God is a God of suddenlies. You wait on the Lord. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We know Isaiah 40, but all of a sudden, bam, here it comes. And then all of a sudden you go, wow, that's what happened with Anna and Simeon. They've been praying. They were getting up in age. They said, I'm f too far along and nope. Here's the Messiah. And man, Jesus touches us and reveals ourselves, and he delivers us and he sets us free for something we've been dealing with or maybe answers a prayer. You get a breakthrough in your prayer and whatever it is, or maybe you have a desire in your heart, a hunger for God Almighty and your prayer life is deepened and your relationship with Jesus is deepened. All of a sudden, man, things change in your life quickly, just like they did with Anna and with Simeon. But you see, we're not biding time. You think you're biding time? No. God is saying, I got plans. Wherever we are in our lives, God's best is still in front of us. I believe that. You believe 2023 is going to be good? Amen. I don't know what will happen. It doesn't say all things will be good, but he says he'll work all things out for, the, for our good. Those who love him are called according to his purpose. He promises that's his word. Romans 8, 28. All of us know that. But you got to believe it because see what happens is the enemy cannot take you out of Jesus's hand because Jesus said, no one can pluck you out of my father's hand, but he can slow you down and he can put discouragement in your heart and my heart and he can stop us from being effective in the kingdom of God. And that's his whole plan for us individually as a family and as a church. But you got to believe and you got to say, Satan in Jesus' name, get away from me and take authority. And then march forward saying, I believe God's best is still yet to come. And God's not quit on any of us. You think God's quit on you? No, you don't. You keep coming with the same problems and issues and so forth. You think God has given up on you and said, I'm tired of hearing that, man. <laughs> no, uh-uh. 
That's not who God is. God's best is, is still in front of us if we'll take it. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. It talks about that Jesus is the potter, that God the Father is the potter, and we're the clay. You think that as a bowl, you've shattered, your life is shattered, and there's no way you can pick the pieces up. But he didn't he didn't refer to us as a bowl. He refers to us as clay. When we mess up, what does he do? He takes that clay back and he forms it again, puts it back on the wheel, and the Father begins to form it again. No, uh-uh. We're not broken in that sense, okay? He just says he's not giving up on any of us here because we're the clay, and we know that the potter can put us all back right. One thing I want to just say here, stop for a moment as we conclude. There are a lot of what ifs in our lives. What if? What if you really believe that God wasn't finished with you yet? What would happen? What if? You know, I'm assessing. And what if it really was true that you could have a, a deeper prayer life? And that you would go deeper than you ever had with Jesus before, you see, because deep calls unto deep. And God is saying, I want you to come deep with the intimacy of your life. I want you to know me, you see. Our main, our main reason being here is to know the Lord, okay? And what if God really did want to make you more like Jesus in the practical, everyday ways that would profoundly change your life? What if? What if? Right? And what if through God's power and mercy, you really were able to overcome that sin that especially haunted you for so long? Whatever it is, something he's working in your life. What if, what if here, what if? What if you aren't too far along? And what if you aren't too far gone? And what if God's best is still in front of you? The what ifs. We're pondering. We're assessing. We're agreeing with God. And then we're moving out. We're believing God instead of believing what the enemy's telling us. Because, see, we all have a past. And we all have a present. But we have a future in Jesus. But we know our past comes back to haunt us sometimes. And we know we're forgiven. But every now and then we feel like that this stuff pops up because see the enemy says you remember what you did back then you remember that I mean that was just the most horrible thing nobody else has ever done anything like that and I mean you, you think your God can forgive you of that you think God still loves you after what you've done do you think he's still there for you you really believe that and see, he revisits. Why? Because he knows he can't take you out of the Father's hand. And he knows you can't, in that salvation, you can't lose that. But he knows he can slow you down. And what happens is we begin to reflect upon that and we begin to mull that over in our lives. And before long, it's like that bird building that nest in our, in our minds. And that nest is there. And here we build on it. And man, Satan uses that and he will beat you and me up if we allow it to happen. So why is it important, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ? Because everything that comes in between these two ears is not God. We need to learn to discern the difference. Satan can speak too. And he'll tell you lies because he's the father of all lies. And he lies to you. You'll never make it. Look at you. You started too late in life. You know good. People told, mom and daddy told me, I, I just would never make anything because my brothers, they were really, and sisters, they excelled, but I, I, didn't, I didn't measure up to them. I'll never make it, you see. That's a lie. The Bible says when we accept Christ that we're a new creation. All things have passed away. All things become new. We're not too far along, and we're not too far gone. Isn't that good news? And the best is yet to come. But we've got to believe it. And we've got to walk in it. And we've got to pray into it. Saying, Lord, I don't know what it means. You know, I pray a prayer that uh, on a regular basis. And it is something I believe we can keep before us. It's Psalm 27, 4. David is saying this. He says, the one thing that I ask, this is what I seek. That I would dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And, and seek him in his temple. And then he says something. And to gaze upon his beauty. 
That's David. And David said the one thing, the one thing. And I'm saying, Lord, what does that mean? The beauty, your beauty, show me. And I know I get glimpses, but I want to see the fullness of his beauty. Don't y'all? <laughs> I believe it. Because it's why? It's the word of God. It wasn't just for David. And it's not just OT. It's, it's NT also, right? The beauty of the Lord. I want to see that. I want a revelation of Jesus in my heart of hearts that will push me forward into the rest of my life until Jesus calls me home and I go home to be with him and then I really will be and the revelation will be in its fullness. I want that. There's no limit to our God. But we've got to believe him instead of these other voices. We've got to know him. And he wants you to know each one here today that he loves you and he'll never stop loving you. And no matter what you've done, where you've been, been from, where you've come from, where you're going, whatever is going on in your life. And in that sanctification process, God is saying, I'm not through with you. And I'm not going to stop until I'm finished. That's the good news. Isn't that good news? The best is still yet to come. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for your presence. Oh, Father, the best is yet to come. We believe it and we receive it and we stand on the promises of God. Thank you, Lord, today for your presence here in this place. Speak to our hearts in a powerful way. Thank you, Lord, today, all you're doing. Just, Lord, help us to realize you're not finished. We just want to be a part. And so give us your power and release your power, Father, that we'd be able to fulfill that calling that we have on each of our lives because we're called. And it is a wonderful calling. We bless you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, one more thing.